Tonight we'll start out with the name of God, which is El Sali. El Sali, which means God, my rock. God, my rock. Second Samuel verse chapter 22 verse 2. He said, "The Lord is my rock and my fortress, on the mountain and my rescuer." Strong's concordance. We'll look at a few words. Rock is number 5553. Selah. Selah. From an unused root meaning to be lofty, a craggy rock, literally or figuratively, a fortress, ragged, rock, stony or stone, stronghold, a stronghold of God, security, security. And it appears in the King James Version of the Bible 60 times. Fortress. Number 4686, Masud, Masud, Masud. A net or capture, also a fastness, fastness. Castle, defense, fortress, stronghold. Be hunted, net, snare, strong place, a strong place. It appears in the King James Version of the Bible 22 times. David in 2 Samuel uh, chapter 22, he sang a song to the Lord when he um, delivered David from all his enemies and from Saul. David sang this. The Lord is my rock and my fortress my deliverer. One of the things I wanted to ask you is, has the Lord given you a song to sing? Have you been so overwhelmed by his grace, by his mercy, by all that he's done for you in your, in your life, that you began to sing a song that came from the depths of your heart, that you couldn't help but to sing? You were compelled to sing it. And it was a song because you were so happy, you were full of joy because of what the Lord had done for you as your rock. David was compelled to sing this song. He said, the Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. You know, when we think about a rock, the Bible talks about in the New Testament about building on a rock rather than building on sand. That when we build on sand, what happens is that if a storm comes, it washes away what we've built. But if you build your, your house on solid ground, on, uh, on the rock, then when a storm comes, it will not blow you away. It will not blow the structure away. It will not blow away your foundation. Amen. Now, one of the things I would invite you to do is to think about the word fortress. Think about it in the context of what that means and what visual representation it comes up in your mind when you see the word fortress. Usually in medieval times or when there were people actually living in castles and things like that, they would have a moat around their castle, which was like a waterway around their castle, which prohibited people from crossing over unless they had access to the drawbridge. And only certain people had access to the drawbridge that could put it down and certain people could come across. If they didn't know you, if you weren't invited, then that drawbridge was not coming down. Amen. And so the Lord is the fortress of your life, is a fortress. And the fortress, we think about that, we think about safety, safety, having safety in the Lord. Amen. And so he. God is revealing himself to us today as our rock, as our fortress, our security, place of safety. Amen. 
and as our deliverer, as David sang in his song. Have you been delivered from something? Is there a, is there a time in your life that God has delivered you from something that you can recall? Take a minute and think about that. That time where God delivered you from something. What does this have to do with your life? What is this being a rock and God being a fortress and God delivering you? How does that influence your life and your relationship with God? Do you believe that he is this rock, this fortress, this deliverer in your life? Amen. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge. So again, God is, is, is someone that we can take refuge in him. We can go to him and feel that safety, that comfort that can only be given by him. That peace that can only happen because of him and having that relationship with him. Because see, this is again is not an intellectual exercise. It's not about what's in your mind in terms of just your mind and thinking a certain way. It's about what's in your heart. What's in your heart? That you go to God and, and in that, because you have that relationship with him, you have refuge in him. Amen. A place of safety and security. David goes on and says, my shield and the horn of my salvation. So we think about a shield, okay? We think about this shield in front of us where nothing can penetrate it. So God is the shield that goes before us that nothing can, can, can penetrate. God is telling us, revealing to us that he is our rock, our fortress, deliverer, refuge, a place of refuge, and our shield. Amen. And the horn of our salvation. He is my stronghold, David says, my refuge, my savior. From violent people, you save me. So David is talking and singing this out loud, singing this about the Lord. He is so overwhelmed and so much joy and so much, you know, just wonder and so much awe of God. So much that's inside of him that he's compelled to sing this song. He's compelled to sing it. Amen. Are you compelled to sing the song? That God has put into your heart. And if so, let it be sung. Sing the song unto the Lord. It doesn't matter, you know, if you were classically trained or if you have a singing voice or not. That's not, that doesn't matter to God. But what matters to God is what's in your heart. Sing unto him. Sing unto him. It doesn't matter if you sound corny. It doesn't matter if someone hears you. Sing the song that God put into your heart. To the world, amen. Honor him and give him the glory for what he's done in your life, amen. In a strong concordance, I'm going to share again with a, a couple of words that we have here. Deliverer, rescuer is palat, palat, number six four zero three. To slip out, that is escape, causatively to deliver, calf, carry away, safe, deliver, cause to escape. So when you're in a situation that's going on in your life, the Lord, our deliverer, our rescuer, will allow us to have a way to escape, will give us a way through the situation, amen, or circumstance. This appears in the King James Version of the Bible 25 times. 25 times. A stronghold, number 4869. Number 4869. Mizgav. Mizgav. Properly a cliff or a lofty or inaccessible place. Abstractly added to altitude. Figuratively, a refuge, a place in Moab, defense, high fort tower. Amen. Appears in the King James Version of the Bible 17 times.
Shield, number 4043. Magain, Magain. A shield, that is the small one or buckler, figuratively or a protector, also the scaly hide of the crocodile. Armed, buckler, defense, ruler, scale. It appears in the King James Version of the Bible 63 times. Definitions Rock is a firm foundation. Fortress is a place that has exceptional security, a stronghold, barrier, castle. Rescuer, deliverer, redeemer, Someone who delivers from confinement, danger, difficulty. You know, when, when you feel like you're in this place that's confined, that's confining you, or a place that's dangerous, or a place that there's difficulties, there's difficulties that you can't surmount, this is where God can show up in your life. This is where, if you allow God, you know, to be God in your life, this is where this, the rock, the fortress, the rescuer, God our rock, the Lord our rock will show up, amen, and will help us and deliver us through the situation, will make a way out of no way, will we'll present people in things and situations so that we can surmount it, so we can get past it, so we can stand strong on a foundation of faith, amen. Now think about David. David fought in probably approximately six to eight major battles. In the Bible, major battles. There were many more battles, but I'm talking about major battles, all right, where he won every single one of them because of the power and the might of God, the power and the might of El Sali. Amen. And so, so when we think about that, David's trust was in the Lord, his rock. That's where he went. He went through the prophets to talk to God. He talked to God, you know, he prayed and he, he worshiped God. Amen. He knew that God was his strength, that God was his rock, his fortress, his rescuer. And think about it. Every time he had a battle that he won, that reinforced who God was in his life. That reinforced his relationship with God. Amen. And so David is is just singing he's so full of of just his joy and his excitement and his joy about what god has done in his life that he begins to sing sing out loud he has to sing amen he has to sing and, and in doing so you know he's so excited he's so excited about you know what god is doing and it gives you an appetite it probably gave david an appetite for what's coming next and not in a, in a foreboding way, but in a way, well, well, you know what? Whatever comes down the road, a war, a battle, whatever happens, God is with me. God is with me. He's going to be there to do for me what I can't do for myself. He's going to be there to show me a way through. As my rock, El Sali, my fortress, El Sali, my rescuer, El Sali. Amen? Now, we also know how David contended with Saul. Now think about this. From the time that David was anointed to be king, young man, young boy, actually young man, was, was anointed to be king. It was 15 years from that moment that 15 years would pass before he would actually take the throne. So he spent 15 years, you know, for the most part, having to really you know contend with how Saul wanted to take him out David hid in caves and in the forest not having much food at certain times relying on on people to assist him relying on Jonathan to to connect with him and to bring him things that he needed to give him information so he was out there and 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 all the time he was out there he relied on El Shali God his rock and what happened was he understood that when God anointed someone, that no one should touch God's anointed. And so David was adamant about not injuring Saul. 
So he did everything he could to stay out of the way of Saul. Once he understood that Saul was coming after him. Okay. And, and there are people probably in your life that, that don't want you to do well in that business adventure. That don't want you to get that promotion at your job. That don't want you to be, you know, the head of that ministry. That don't want you to go and travel to Africa. I don't want you to go and travel to uh, Venezuela or some other country. That doesn't want you to succeed in your life. There could be people in you, even in your own family that don't want you to succeed. And they set up obstacles and barriers in, in your life so that you don't succeed. There could be people that are in your friendship group, quote unquote friendship group, who don't want you to be all that you can be. But God, but God is there as your rock, as your foundation. God is there as your fortress to protect you, to bring you to a place of security, a place of safety. God is there to deliver you, to rescue you, to redeem you, to allow you to, to get through those difficult moments and to allow you to not be confined, but to be open and free to go and to maneuver in the ways in which you will give him the glory. Amen. And this is this is the David that is singing the song about El Salah, Salai, God, our rock. He is so happy and so so just in awe of God's strength and his might in his life as he fought all those battles, as he contended with, with, with Saul. God was there for him. Just like God is there for us today as our rock, as our fortress, and our rescuer. Amen. Never forget that God is far more interested in our getting to know the deliverer than simply being delivered. That's by Beth Moore. She's an evangelist. Now, one of the things I, I guess I really want to bring this point home is that God wants a relationship with us through his son, Jesus Christ. We don't have, have access to God, but through his son, Jesus once we know Jesus is our Lord and our Savior, then we have access to God. Amen? And so, upon that access, He wants us to be in relationship with Him. That means we're praying. That means we're listening for God. That means we're being in alignment with God. That means that we are um, studying the Scripture, reading the Scripture, meditating, chewing on the Scripture. That is life, that, that we are, you know, two or three times a week we're fasting. Or fasting with the church. We know that we're doing this. It's a part of our lifestyle. Amen. And during those times, we commit those times that we agree to fast to focusing on God in the scriptures and hearing from him. Amen. And so it's so important to have that relationship with God. God values the relationship we have with him. And God, you know, wants us to to consult him about things. And, and then we have the opportunity to give God the glory when we get through something, when we succeed in something. Because it's all about him, not about us. It's not about our might. It's about God and his power. It's about being in that right relationship with him. Amen. Questions to consider. What does it mean to you to have a God in your life who is your rock? What does it mean to you to have a God in your life who is your rock? When you think of God as your fortress, what does that mean to you? What does that mean to you? And again, I'm, I'm, I want you to consider these questions because I want you to take them away with you and really allow yourself to journal about them, allow yourself to talk to your friends about them, you know, allow yourself to even give us feedback if you want. Uh, you can send it to admin at kokembassy.org. If you want to give us feedback about uh, the Bible study or feedback about the questions that you've considered and how they apply to your life. Amen. 
Has God ever rescued you? If so, do you remember that very moment or hour when he rescued you? Now, this is important because when we can go back and recall those times and probably many times where God has rescued us, delivered us, it it really strengthens our faith and it really allows us to stand on that rock, to stand on that foundation of faith that we have and to know that God is God in our lives. To know that that time when things were, were, were you, when things were pressing against you, when things were tough, that God showed up. That time when you thought you, you had no money, you thought it was a, it was the end of everything, but then God showed up. That time when your even your friends or even your family members came at you out of the blue, God was there and gave you comfort and gave you peace. There were times when you know you couldn't get a promotion at your job and you hung in there, hung in there, and then God released you from the job, and then, and then you found another job that paid you better money with a better position. Amen. God showed up. That time when you were, uh, you know, had to work late and then there was some people outside your job at nighttime and you were kind of, you know, filled with a little bit of fear and, and God was there and, and, and told you to well, go this way instead of going that way. And because you listened and you were obedient to him, then that that which could have been harmful to you passed by you, didn't hurt you. And you were able to find a way because God gave you that way out. Amen. So these are questions I really invite you to consider to write in your journal because when you write in your journal about this, at some point, you might find at some point that you have grown spiritually, that you are not in the same place that you are now in terms of you have received more revelation, more understanding about God, more understanding about who he is in your life. And, and thus, you're going to be able to see where you were and then where you are now and how far God has brought you, how far he's brought you, and give him all the glory. Amen. Amen. All right, let's move on. Jehovah Jireh, some people call it, but actually in the Hebrew, it's pronounced Jehovah Yiri. Jehovah Yiri. And it means the Lord will provide. The Lord will provide. Genesis 22 verse 14. So Abraham named that place the Lord will provide. And it is said to this day on the mountain of the Lord it will be seen, it will be seen and provided. It will be seen and provided. Jehovah Jireh. Symbolic name given by Abraham to Mount Moriah in commemoration of the interposition of the angel of Jehovah, the angel of the Lord, who prevented the sacrifice of Isaac and provided a substitute. Before we go on, it's important to understand that here, as we go on into the telling of, of this particular uh, story regarding Abraham, Isaac, and the angel of, of, of the Lord, that Abraham was being tested by God. He was being tested by God. Okay, we're going to go further into that, what that means later on. But I just wanted to un let you, you know, sort of see that, that he was being tested in that, in that whole scenario, in that whole story. He was being tested. Now, let's look at more about what the strong concordance has for us in terms of some words. Jehovah Yiri, which is Jehovah Jireh, is number 3070. 3070. Jehovah will see to it, Jehovah Jireh, a symbolic name for Mount Moriah. It occurs in the King James Version of the Bible one time, just one time. Mount, number 2022, 20, Har, Har. 
a mountain or range of hills, sometimes used figuratively. Hill, hill country, mountain, and promotion. In the King James Version of the Bible, 537 times. Scene, number 7200, Ra'ah, Ra'ah. Advise self, appear, approve, behold, consider, discern, to make, to, enjoy, have experience, gaze, take heed, indeed, joyfully, look, mark, meet, be near, perceive, present, provide. Regard, have, respect, foreseen, cause to, let, see, seer, one another, shown, sight of others, spy, stare, surely, think, view, visions. It occurs in the King James uh, Version of the Bible 1,322 times. Now, some interesting facts. Interesting facts. Mount Moriah is significant for many reasons. It is a place where there were many biblical acts of faith were done. It is a sacred place for Christians, Jews, and Muslims, which sits on a 37 acre tract of land. Now, given, you know, 37 acres is, you know, it's, it's a nice little plot of land. But again, consider what's actually there. It's actually a small piece of land. The Jews, the Jewish temple once stood there. Over a thousand years after Abraham and Isaac's experience on Mount Moriah, King David bought the threshing floor from Ara, the Jeshubite. David built an altar there to the Lord to hold back a plague from the people. You can find that in 2 Samuel chapter 24, verse 18 and verse 21. King Solomon built the temple on that site and it stayed there up until King Nebuchadnezzar's armies destroyed it in, 50, in 587 or 589 BC. The temple was rebuilt 70 years later by Jews who returned from their captivity in Babylon. It's also the place where Jesus cleansed the temple. You can find that in the Gospel according to John, chapter 2, verse 15. Sometime around A.D. 70, the Romans destroyed the temple. All that remained was the western wall, the Wailing Wall. Now, the Wailing Wall is what we see sometimes in videos. If you go to Israel, go to Jerusalem, go to the, the, West, the Wailing Wall, you'll see people uh, who are Orthodox Jews and, and, and Jews in general that will go there. And people who visit there will go there and they will uh, pray while they're there. They'll recite prayers or pray to God while they're there. Sometimes they even put notes into the little crevices or prayers into the little crevices, you know, upon before they leave. Uh, and that's, that's a big, big deal um, in, in Israel, the Wailing Wall, the Western Wall. The third temple is supposed to be built on that same spot, according to Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. Genesis chapter 12, verse 2. Then he said, take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. Now, again, let me just set the pace here. Here we are, you know, the angel of the Lord is speaking to Isaac. God is saying to him, you take your son, Isaac, the only son you have, the whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah on top of a mountain 
and offer him as a burnt offering. Now, if someone's a parent, you're a dad or a mom, you go to, when someone says that, you go to some changes. That presents some changes for you emotionally, okay, emotionally. And to the point where if you're really in your emotions, then you're going to probably go down the wrong path and do something, you know, that is not what God would have you do because you're full of emotion. Because we know when whenever we lead by, led by emotions or led by our feelings, usually the outcome does not benefit us. Okay. But here we see that, that Isaac, that, um, Abraham is being talked to. Now, I want to bring your attention to something because this is important. When we see here, take your, your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love. This is like a foretelling or foreshadowing of Jesus Christ, the only begotten son of God, whom he loves, that was sacrificed on the cross at Calvary for our, for our re, um, redemption, and for our salvation, the forgiving of sins. And so what we have here alludes back to or for, is a foretelling of what's to happen to Christ. Okay. Now, if we look in the Old Testament, we, we often see references to Jesus Christ. If we look for them, they're right there. All right. And this is one of them. Genesis chapter 12, verse 4 to 5. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. The lad and I will go yonder and worship, and we will come back to you. Now again, you can see the reference to Jesus Christ. We know that when he went to the cross and died on the cross, shed blood on the cross for us, that he rose again on the third day. Now we have here that Abraham on the third day lifted up his eyes and he saw the place from afar off. So the third day is mentioned. And then at the bottom, this is really important, we read that he says, we will come back to you. He knew that God had said to him to go offer Isaac as a, a uh, as a as an offering as a sacrifice but in the same mindset or breath he said we will come back to you so there is a reference to the resurrection of Christ is all because he's talking about that he believed probably that his son Isaac would be resurrected because again God had promised him that through Isaac there would be kings and there would be multitudes and there would be nations that would be that would be connected to them because of Isaac okay so Abraham believed God right? he believed God Genesis chapter 12 7b to 8 and then he said look the fire and the wood but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide. Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Yiri, will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering. So the two of them went together. Now this is his son. His son is saying to him, basically, Dad, you know, you know, we got everything we need and everything, but where is the lamb that we're going to slaughter? Where is the lamb that we're going to you know, put there for the sacrifice? And his father is telling him that God's going to provide. He will God, God will provide. Jehovah, Yiri, Jehovah, Jireh will provide. And his son, I'm thinking, is, you know, going about his merry way, listening to his father with complete trust, with complete, you know, faith as his father has complete faith. Genesis 12, verse 12. And he said, do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. 
Now, this is the angel of the Lord speaking to Abraham. As Abraham has the knife, getting ready to, 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 to sacrifice his son Isaac, the angel of the Lord stops him and says, Do not lay your hand on the lad. Do, do or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. A couple things I want to discuss here. Do you think that God tested Abraham to see if he feared him? Because to look at this sentence, it looks like, well, God wanted to figure out, well, you know, did, did Abraham fear me? But that's not the case. That's not the case. God knows every single thing about us. God created us. God knows what's in our hearts. He knows every single thing. There's nothing that God does not know. Understand that. There's nothing that God does not know, that God does not see. He knows everything before we know it. God is not in time like we are in time. God is outside of time. God made time. He actually made time. So understand this. So it wasn't about God having to find out by testing Abraham whether or not Abraham feared him. Abraham was tested so that God could show him, Abraham, to himself. Today, when you are tested, God is, is testing you so that you can see yourself. And in that, you're going to learn from the experience. You have the opportunity to learn from the experience, to receive revelation, all right, to, to, to be pruned and to be refined. In the sanctification process, you're being refined and you're being you know, pruned so that you grow spiritually, so that you mature spiritually. So that, you know, you'll have the heart and the mind of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. This is what it's all about. So the minute that you recognize that you've been tested or God's testing you, count it all joy when you go through trials and tribulations. Count it all joy because in that God, because God and who he is in the heart of God, he's going to make a way through. It's already been established. But we have to trust him. God is 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 going to give us an opportunity to, to have victory through him, to have victory. Amen. Because God will never set us up to fail. God will never set up his children to fail. It's going to always be a setup for victory through Christ Jesus. Amen. So here we know that Abraham is truly being tested so that Abraham will see for himself that he fears the Lord because he was able to not withhold his son, his only son that he loved from God, the son that was going to be his heir. Amen. So now the question is for us, is there anything that we would withheld, withhold from God? If God asked us to give our car to somebody else, are we going to withhold that from God? If God asked us to give this money to this particular person, particular person, or to give these finances to, to this particular organization, are we going to withhold that from God? If God asked us to go talk to somebody, or go pray with somebody, or, or intercede with somebody, are we going to withhold these words from God, these prayers from God, our time from God? If we know that we are to be in consecration, if we know that we are to read the scriptures, are we going to withhold our time from God so that we you know, can increase our relationship with him and our knowledge of him? Are we going to withhold our time away from God? Are we going to withhold our praise and thanksgiving that gives glory to God? Are we going to withhold that from God? Are we going to withhold our prayer language from God? A prayer language that he established within us so that he, we could pray things that we might not even know what we're praying. But God knows all of what we're saying. Because he's given it to us to say. To pray. Amen. So the invitation here is to think about 
What are you withholding or what or what would you withhold from God? Is there anything? And then also, when the times that God has tested you, did you have to repeat those tests over and over again? Because you really weren't about doing what God had said? Okay. Or what God has shown you to do before. So you so you flunked the test and you had to repeat it several times. Or are you one that when you hear God say something and it gives you a, a direction, an instruction, that you are submitted to him and obedient and you just do what he says, whether you understand it or not, whether you feel like it or not, you do it. Because again, the king, being before the king and what the king says is not a democracy. What the king says, we do. What the king has written, we go by and we abide in. So being a kingdom citizen is not a democracy. You don't get to take it cafeteria style. Amen. So I just wanted to make that point clear. Genesis chapter 22, verse 14. And Abraham called the name of the place the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. Now, when we think about mountain, we think about mountain. We think about that it is a place where God resides. It's a place that that people go. It's a place where God is. We see that in the New Testament, Jesus would often go up the mountain as a place where he would go to pray. All right. And so if you think about this, when you're going up a mountain, you're ascending. When you go up a mountain, you have to climb up. You have to go up higher. So I believe a part of this, too, is about when we are, are, are trusting Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Yiri, that the Lord, the Lord will provide, the Lord that provides, that we are to go up higher than our circumstance, amen? We are to go up higher than what we see, than what we feel, than what we think. Because the Bible is clear, do not lean on our own understanding of things. Don't do it. Don't go there. The Bible is clear that, that you know, we might see a thing, but because we see it, it doesn't mean that it's right for us or that is what we need to do. But the, and the Bible also says for us to be a people of faith. That we don't have to see a thing to know that God is God in our lives. And that he is our provider, Jehovah Yiri, Jehovah Jireh. Our faith says that we believe in things that we cannot see. And if you had any experience with God, you know this to be true. You know that you know that you know that God will provide. Amen. That God will provide. You know, there was a time in my life where I was homeless for a little bit of time. Actually, it wasn't a little bit of time. It was a significant period of time. And during that time, which was a time that I was out of my element because I had never been homeless in my life. But during that time, and I've always worked and I've always, you know, had money and, you know, paid my bills for the most part. But during this time, I had nothing. In every step of the way, and I'll just tell you in brevity, in every step of the way, God provided for me. Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Yiri was there without a doubt. Every step of the way. And when there was a time I didn't know, God made it clear to me what to do, what to say, and where to go. And I did exactly as he instructed me to do. I was obedient and I submitted to him. Because what he was bringing me through, what he was showing me, there was a lot of beautiful beautiful times and beautiful things that I saw that had I not listened, had I not been obedient, had I not been submitted to him, I would have missed it, completely missed it. I received revelation and understanding and knowledge of my father. And I also received some testing. He tested me. 
And that confirmed to me the heart that he gave me. That confirmed to me that that I was a, a product of his glory, that I was a product of, of of being obedient and submitting to him. That that what was changed in my heart was a God thing. I couldn't change it, but God changed it. How I viewed people, how I loved on people, that was all God. And there were many, many people he sent to me during that time of when I was homeless. Many, many people. And some were probably angels in disguise that showed up right on time, had the right words, the right kind of comfort, and told me words and, and of, you know, gave me words that were prophetic. And I saw many things during that time. And I believe it was about my submitting to the Father, complete submission. Not because I had to, but because in my heart I desired to. And I was obedient to him. So Jehovah Jireh will provide. Jehovah Yiri will provide. This is important. And the more experiences you have where God has done this, it really, you know, sits you on a firm foundation to, to knowing that no matter what come down, comes down the road, that he's going to be there for you. Because you know that you know that you know God is and God does for those who belong to him. Amen. Amen. This is to consider. Is God your provider? Are you allowing God to be the provider in your life? Or are you trying to set up your own life? Are you trying to deal with things on your own? Are you trying to uh, be your own God? Or is God your provider? Have you submitted to God? Have you surrendered to him? Have you obeyed him when he's told you to do something? When he's shown you a path or when he's given you revelation, when he's given you understanding, have you got out of your own way? Do you trust that God will provide what you need? Now, a lot of us, we want a lot of things. Like children, you know, do sometimes, you go take a child to a toy store, that child's gonna want a lot of those toys. You know, and the more cart, you know, more that you fill up each cart with the, with those toys, you know, that child is gonna probably want much more. And you have to get another cart, another cart. If you go along with what the cart, with the what the child needs, you know, versus what the child wants, and versus what the child needs. So parents usually will give their their children some different toys. You know, something that they need so they can play and have fun. Absolutely. However. It's what they need, not what they always want. Because a child that always wants, if you give them everything they want all the time, then they'll never know that feeling of being without something. Or they'll never res- they'll never respect the fact of they have enough or that what they have is, is, is good enough. You know, so that they don't feed into the world's thoughts about, you know, having to have this, having to... To have the newest thing, having to have it right away. Um, I must get this, must get that. No, it's really about teaching them how to be responsible. You know, how to be responsible, how to respect their their things, how to keep them in a good place, and how to keep them up, and how to work hard for what they earn, how to earn what they want, how to earn what they need, even. And that starts early on in their life as as they're growing up. That training of a child starts early. Amen. So do you trust that God will provide what you need? Or are you the, the, you know, the 10 year old uh, child and that 40 year old person who was, you know, stomping their feet, temper tantrums and they wanted everything they see? I hope not. Because if you are. An adult, it's important to behave like an adult. If you are an adult, it's an important that you allow yourself to not get in your own way. To allow yourself to receive from what God provides for you. And to really take care of what he gives. Amen. Going to the mountain is analogous, like we said before, to going to God for what we need. Do you go to God with your needs. It's really important in our prayer time when we're praying, 
when we're at, when we're talking to God, when we're having a conversation with God, it's about telling him what we need. Father, you know, this is something I need. I need this new vehicle. I need these new tires. I need this um, new uh, apartment in this new location. I, I want to get this job that I, I've been waiting for. Um, I, I want to understand uh, how to how to do this particular uh, function at work. Whatever it is that you think you need. Because see, when you're in relationship with God, when you are in that right kind of relationship with God, in that right alignment, then your needs, what you want, you know, and your needs, they begin to change. They begin to change and they became they become more in alignment with what God is about. They become more in alignment with who he is and what he is saying or what he has put in our hearts. So that time when you wanted maybe to have that, you know, uh, fast car that, you know, went, you know, 200 something miles an hour or whatever. Now, because you mature spiritually. That's changed that maybe you want something that's much more compatible with your needs in terms of being a family. So maybe that sports car is not going to hold your family, but a nice, you know, Yukon or a nice truck, uh, four doors or with a nice, you know, uh, van. That's something that can hold a family and take you on family outings. Amen. So it's important that we understand God is our provider. Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Yiri. The God who provides. And to let God be God in our lives. Amen. So important. Jehovah Nisi. Jehovah Nisi. The Lord our banner. The Lord our banner. Exodus chapter 17, verse 8 to 16. And Moses built an altar and named it, The Lord is my banner, saying, The Lord has sworn an oath. The Lord will have war against the people of Amalek from generation to generation. Now something some in Strong's. Jehovah Nisi, number 3071. Jehovah my banner, symbolic altar in the desert. In the King James Version of the Bible, one time. Biblical definition of banner. In ancient times and throughout scripture, banners were standards declaring allegiance to God, a nation, or an army. Banners help lead Israelites into battle. Ancient followers of Yahweh used banners to declare the majesty and the glory of the Lord and to beckon the lost to his safety. Okay, so when there's a banner, when there's a banner, it was seen that it, you were in allegiance with God. And you were coming together as a nation. You were being unified as an army under his banner. Amen. And that meant you were in covenant with God. You were under his protection. Amen. And that's a big deal. To be under God's protection. And that God is going to fight for you. God is going to be there to, to, to carry you through. Amen. And that, that, that needs to be an expectation of a kingdom citizen. That when you go, if, you, if you're going into a war-like situation at work or, or what have you, wherever you might be, that God is your banner. You are under his banner. You are in allegiance with him and all of his children. You are in allegiance. You are united with all of who belong to him. Okay, and under his banner... We're declaring his majesty. We're declaring his glory. Okay. And we don't have to wait for something to happen to declare God's glory or majesty. We declare his majesty and his glory no matter what. No matter what. Amen. 
definition of banner that's in you know dictionary is something that identifies and unifies a particular group of people. For example, a military flag or standard is sometimes called a banner. The Israelites saying the Lord is my banner was a way of identifying themselves as a unified followers of the Lord God. A banner also functions as a rally point for troops in a battle. So say if, if you were uh, a troop in a battle and and then, you know, and you would see in the medieval times and other times, even in today's wars, there's someone who has a flag that is, that is a united, uniting the troops under that particular banner. And what well, the Israelites, what we said before, they came and they, their banner was about God and, and glorifying his name and, and showing his majesty and really just, you know, taking heart to what God was for them and how God revealed to them that he was their banner. Amen. Jehovah Nisi. Exodus 17, verse 10 to 11. So Joshua did as Moses said and fought with Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the hilltop. Now when Moses held up his hand, Israel prevailed, and when he lowered his hand due to fatigue, Amalek prevailed. Okay, so get the visual of Moses uh, and Aaron and her going up to the hilltop. Okay, they're going to the hilltop. And I would say hilltop, you can call it like maybe even a mountain, some sort of a mountain, but it's going up higher. Okay, going up higher. And when we see this, we see that as he's going up higher, that um, he is holding up his hands you know and in his hands is a staff the same staff that parted the red sea that god used and worked through to part the red sea so he's so he's holding up the staff unto god and 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 this is this is the banner this is god being the banner right here and as he's holding up his hands okay uh he, he begins to get a little you know fatigue he begins to get a little fatigue all right, so let's see what happens. In Exodus chapter 17, verses 12 to 13. But Moses' hands were heavy, and he grew tired. And they took a stone and put it under him. And he sat on it. Then Aaron and Hur held up his hands one on one side and one on the other side. So it was that his hands were steady until the sun set. So Joshua overwhelmed and defeated Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. So here we see, okay, that as Moses is holding up the staff in his hand, all right, he's, he's getting tired. All right, he's getting very tired. So Aaron and Hur were there with him. Now, what I want to point you to is here because they put a stone for him to, you know, to to set on so that he wouldn't, you know, tire out with you know, his legs. All right. And then I then they both went on either side of him and held up his hands and held up his hands. Now, I, I want to invite you to think about this. Do you have people in your life that hold up your hands that hold you down? Or hold you up when things are going on in your life do you have friends who are not just you know uh, fair weather friends but are there no matter what's going on in your life they are there to support you like Aaron and her were there to support Moses Moses knew who he was taking him to the to the hilltop with him he knew he was who he was going up there with he didn't, he didn't pick slouches okay he picked people that were gonna add value to his life Aaron and her added value to his life. Okay? And so as Moses was getting tired, you know, they, they got a rock and put it under him. Because they knew that as his hands were up in the air, as long as his hands were up in the air with the staff, that they that the, the Israelites were gonna they were winning the war. They were winning the battle. But the minute his hands started to come down, the Amaleks, they began to win. So they needed to keep his hands up. 
They need to keep his hands raised up. Amen. So it's important to have people that are in your corner, to have people who are there for you, to support you, to be there for you, to do things for you that you need that maybe you don't even know you need, but they know that you need. And it's not until after the fact that you you realize, wow, yeah, thank you for doing that because I didn't even I wasn't even aware of that. And I would have tired myself out by doing it this way, but you showed me another way because you're there to back me up. You're there as my friends. You're there to raise me up. Amen. Likewise, what happened here was was what was going on with with um, Moses and and Aaron and her was that they were there to back up Moses. They were there to help him in any way possible and to to be attuned to what he would need, even when he couldn't speak it or say it. And then they were putting a stone under him so they so he wouldn't, you know, so he could relieve some of the tiredness. And then they both went on either side of him and raised up his hands, kept them steady until the sun set. And so it says here in, in verse 13, so Joshua overwhelmed and defeated Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. Because as the hands went up, and Moses held the staff. They were under the banner of the Lord. Under the banner of the Lord. Exodus chapter 17, verse 15 and 16. And Moses built an altar and named it, The Lord is my banner. Saying, The Lord has sworn an oath, the Lord will have war against the people Amalek from generation to generation. So when God says that he will do something, he will do it. The Lord is my banner. The Lord is my banner. So whenever you have a war, any kind of war, any kind of time where there's opposition from someone to you that they want to bring you down they want to take you down they want to take away what you have they want to get in the way of your success they want to you know cause a file to come on to play they want to just break things down that you have understand that you have a god in your life in your heart that is your banner and that you are under that banner and so as god has promised in his holy word as God has promised in his holy word to us, as he's given us promises, as he's given us prophetic words, as he's given us, you know, prophetic dreams, as he's given us, you know, uh, uh, the words that are in the scriptures, that we are to take heed to those words and know that as he has said, it will be done because God's word never comes back void, never. It always goes out and it always completes that in which it's sent to complete. I'm just paraphrasing there, but that, that's in scripture. And so, but it's important to think about whether we believe that or not. Is that belief in our hearts? Are we believing just intellectually? Or we, are we believing with our hearts that this is the case, that we are under the banner of God, we are part of the household of God, we are part of the kingdom, and thus, the promises are ours. What the word says, it's ours too. Amen. In Psalms chapter 20, verse 6 and 7, it reads, Now I know that the Lord saves his anointed. He will always, he will answer, he will answer them from his holy heaven with the saving strength of his right hand. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will remember and trust in the name of Yahweh, Yahweh, our God, our Adonai. Okay. And in this verse is so important because it says here that, that, you know, now I know that the Lord saves his anointed. So you have had experiences as God has revealed himself as your banner. You've had experiences with God. 
that you can rely on, that you can count upon, that you can say, yes, this happened, that happened, and this happened. And it was all because of God's grace and his mercy, his love for me. Because I'm one of his anointed. And his right hand was a saving strength of his right hand was in my life. And I can see it as clear as day that it was God because there was no other way out. There was no other way to contend with this. There was no other thing that could happen but God. But God. Amen. But God. And it says some trust in chariots and some trust in horses. There are some of you who trust in other things. Some of y'all might trust in trees. I don't know. Some of y'all might trust in your vehicle more than you trust in God. Some of y'all might trust in your own thinking more than you trust God. Some, might, some of you might trust in your own understanding of something rather than trusting God, rather than trusting the revelations that come from knowing him and being in relationship with God. The Bible is clear. Do not lean on your own understanding that God, his thoughts and ways are higher than ours. And if that's the case, why are we, you know, so focused and, and like Velcro onto a person, onto a place, onto some sort of somebody speaking uh, something on TV that's this new age, whatever? Why are we taking them for, for, for their word when the Bible is clear, okay, that God is God and that the Bible is, is God giving us instruction? It's our constitution as kingdom citizens. So why are we trusting in these things that can never, ever hold a candle to God, can never be God in our lives? Because the minute that we give something or someone else the place where God should sit in our hearts and sit in our lives, that's idolatry. That's idolatry. Okay? Okay. But we are to remember, remember and trust in the name of Yahweh our Adonai, Jehovah Nisi, God our banner. Amen. This is so important. And I really, I'm trying to bring this point home. I'm inviting you to reflect for yourself where you at. Where it concerns these matters, where are you at when it concerns the scriptures, where it concerns God in your life? And it really, you know, examine yourself and understand if you're not in, in alignment with God, all you need to do is repent, have a heart that's, that has some godly sorrow and contrite heart and repent to God. And move away from sin, move away from old negative patterns that you've been doing and, and, and idolatry, whatever, and turn back to God and ask for forgiveness while it is still time, while you can still do it today. Don't wait till tomorrow evening and say, oh, well, I'll do it next week or I'll do it, you know, the day after next. No, if you understand that this is what you need to do right now, do it right now. Father, I repent for 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 placing, you know, people or things, you know, above you. I repent of idolatry, Father. I repent, Father, of not trusting you. I repent, my Lord God, of not seeing you as my banner. Of not seeing you as my provider, Jehovah Yiri. Of not seeing you, you know, as my rock, El Sali. I repent, Father. For not, you know, receiving all that you have to offer me. For, for, for not being obedient at times. I repent, my Lord God. Please forgive me. And I, I choose to turn towards you. I choose to cling to you, Father. In Jesus' name. And then it can be the beginning for you to take another step in the right direction that's heading towards the Father. Amen. Questions to consider. Do you have people in your life who will lift you up and stand with you when you cannot stand alone? Are there people? You know, if there are people in your life 
that that are like Aaron and her that held up Moses's arms and put a rock under him so that he could you know sit there and stand there as long as he did with the staff raised while the Amalekites were being decimated uh, and 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 uh, Israelites won because they were actually you know because um, because the staff was being held up. Is there a people in your life like Aaron and her that you take to the hilltop with you? You take them there with you because you know their character and you know their heart for you and they add value to your life. So you take them to the hilltop with you. You take them into the situations that you're confronted. You invite them into being your sounding board. You invite them into understanding your thought process about something. You invite them into helping you to articulate something, helping you to work through a problem or whatever it might be. And while there, you listen for you listen to them. While there, you let them assist you. While there, you let them, you know, uh, let you see the things that you can't readily see yourself. Have you been doing that? Have you been doing that? Because if you have these people in your life, whether it be family members, whether it be friends of yours, okay, whether they be a mentor of yours or a pastor of yours. I would invite you to really appreciate them. Appreciate them in terms of letting them know how much they add value to to your life. How much that you really respect them. How much really you honor them for being who they are in your life. And that that you're thankful for them being in your life. Because sometimes we don't say thank you to people sometimes we don't tell them how important they are sometimes we don't say these things that are seem like little words but that mean so much to people to hear it and also so much to us to say it to them tell them that you love them tell them that you are happy that they are in this world with you amen are you under the banner of jehovah nisi if so what does that look like in your life So if God is your banner, if he is your banner, what does that look like in your life? You know, do you see your life that's that's, uh, flourishing? Is your life, you know, different than what it was yesterday or was it different than it was last year? Is your life, you know, as you see it, is it much more alive in your life? Are you much more, you know, just down with whatever God has said for you to do, are you adhering to your call? Okay, knowing that God is your banner. No. Um, or, or are you letting fear stop you? So again, these are questions that I want you to consider, that I invite you to consider. And again, I really suggest that you get a, a journal, whether you do it digitally or whether you do it with paper or, or in pen. But get a journal that can document these questions that you can answer for yourself, okay, in your own privacy of your own of your own home or space. And then as you grow and as you begin to mature, continue to mature, hopefully, then you can go back on 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 you know this journal and see, okay, like you know, where was I last year at this time when I actually answered these questions, and where am I at right now with these same questions? And how have I changed? And how has God transformed me? From that time until this time, what's different about me? You know, am I getting closer to God? Am I growing in the way that God wants me to grow? Amen. And let me just say too, you know, when you keep a journal, and this is what I suggest, that you put on at the top of the heading, you put uh, the date. Okay, you put, you know, like something of a reference point. Uh, mind you, you might say that, okay, this is a, from a Bible study that I was attending. These questions came from there. Or you could put, um, you know, something about a title, you know, regarding the questions. And maybe the name of God that we're, we're discussing. You can put that up top. And then put a subheading that says, you know, where I am today with these with these questions in terms of the answers. Okay. And then make a plan uh, to, to revisit this maybe within another, you know, three months or another six months and then maybe you know another you know year and to see where you progress and this is you know it could be time consuming for some 
but it's a good thing to, to have a time where you're actually going to write in your journal and actually uh, look back and reflect on what you found. And, and even pray before you look into it. Pray, uh, you know, before and after. Again, giving God the glory. Amen. Now's the time when you can give your tithes and offerings. If you belong or a member of another church, your tithe goes to the church where you are a member. Your tithe goes to the church where you are a member. And at this point, what I want to say is that if you are a member of KOKE, then your tithes and offerings come here. So I'll pray over the tithes and offerings. Father, we thank you for those who have a heart to give today. We thank you, Father, for those who have a heart to give but cannot give, my Lord God. And Father, we pray that that men will press into their bosoms, that it will be overflowing, what will come back to them for their giving, my Lord God. And may they flourish, my Lord God, in all that they do and all that they receive. In Jesus' holy name we pray. pray. Amen and amen. Now, if some of you have, you know, found yourself, you know, needing to come back to, to, to God, need to come back and just re restore yourself to, to having Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, or if maybe you haven't done it already, you haven't received Christ, here's the time you can do it. I want you to raise your right hand and I want you to repeat it after me. I believe that Jesus Christ is Lord and I want to receive him as the Lord of my life. I believe that God, that God raised him from the dead, that God raised him from the dead on the third day. The Bible says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe, you know, that he was raised on the third day by the Father, resurrected by the Father, that you would be saved. Amen. And now, you know. I want you to continue to raise your right hand and say that you, that I, you put your name there, I believe in the king. And I believe in the kingdom message. And if you said that you believe in the king and the kingdom message and you receive that it is not a democracy, that you will do what the king says. And that you will be about the constitution of the king, which is our Bible. The word of God. Praise the Lord. Welcome to the kingdom. Amen. Amen. You know, if you receive Jesus Christ for your Lord and Savior uh, for the first time tonight, and if you have, you know, have raised your right hand and, and, and desire to become a kingdom citizen, then we want to hear from you to put some material into your hand. So what I want you to do is write this down. This is our email address. Admin. That's A-D-M-I-N. At that at sign. Kingdom. I mean, um, KOK Embassy. That's KOK Embassy, one word, dot org. Again, admin at KOK Embassy dot org. Send us, drop us an email. Let us know that you received Jesus Christ for the first time or that you're returning back to him uh, and that you're reconfirming your, your, your commitment to him being your Lord and Savior and that you are desired to be a part of the kingdom. And let us get some material into your hand. Praise the Lord. Amen. Congratulations. Amen. And now we're at the end of this session. And so what I want to do is we're going to I'm going to pray us out. And then after I pray out, if you have any questions uh, that you want to to ask or if you have any uh, comments that you want to give, we'll take that after I pray out. And after I pray out, if you have to leave, feel free to leave. Um, I'm just going to take about maybe uh, five or ten minutes to answer any questions or to, uh, you know, uh, receive any comments from people um, after I pray out. OK, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this evening. We thank you, Father. We bless you. We bless your holy name, Father. We bless you, Father, Jehovah Nisi. We bless you that you are a banner, my Lord God. We bless you that you are El Sali, our rock, my Lord God. We bless you, Father, that you are Jehovah Yiri, Jehovah 
but Jireh, you are the God who provides. And Father, we thank you for revealing your names to us. We thank you for this revelation, my Lord God. We thank you that you have wanted to enter into relationship with us, and we bless you for that, Father. And Father, as we leave this place, may your word be written across our minds and our hearts, Father. And may we always remember who you are in, in, in to us in our hearts and who you are in our lives, my Lord God. And that we will rely on you. We will trust in you. We will, uh, you know, be submitted to you, Father. And we will obey you, my Lord God. And so allow that to be, to penetrate in our hearts, my Lord God, as we leave this place. So that anyone that we encounter, we will give you the glory, my Lord God. We'll let it be known to all that we encountered that we give you the glory and we give you the honor and we give you the praise. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Blessed be his holy name. Amen and amen. Amen, amen, amen. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. So is there anyone who has any questions or any thoughts that want to share? If not, then we'll end the session. Okay. We'll end the session. Stay blessed. Have a great, great, continued to be great week.